So this week we're talking all about ethics and copyright. So first of all, I'm going to start off by saying um, disclaimer. Laws can change and may differ in different countries, states, and counties. The following information is based on my own understanding. Um, it is not legal advice. If you need legal counsel, please contact an attorney. Okay, so having said that, here we go. So copyright protects original artistic works, photography included. Um, here is a video from the Copyright Patent Office and we're not going to watch the whole thing, or we're not going to watch it right now, but I would definitely encourage you that if you are going to work in photography as a graphic designer, uh, if you're going to own your own business, anything like that, this is definitely a great video so that you can get a feel of what the differences are and when you need to have a trademark, a patent, or a copyright. So, first question. Who owns the copyright to a photograph? Um, a lot of people might say, well, it's the person who paid the photographer or the person in the photo. But in fact, the photographer owns the copyright. And the photographer owns the copyright immediately. As soon as that shutter is pressed, they own it. Um, and so the rule is that whoever presses the shutter owns the photo. So even if you're using somebody else's camera, if you hit the shutter, you own the copyrights to that photograph. Okay, now um, a situation where that is not true is if you are a work-for-hire photographer. If you are a work-for-hire photographer, that means that you have been hired by a company as an employee, and they are paying you uh, your hourly wage, they are taking care of your benefits and such, and you have signed a contract with them that states that you are photographing for that company and that they now own the copyrights to whatever work you create while you're working for them. Um, but it, is, it does have to be explicit. If it's a contractor type of situation where you are not a regular employee, you are just working um, on a project with somebody, then you still own the copyrights to your photographs. So there's been some different cases that have come up where this is questioned and one of them is <laughs> what if an animal takes the photo so this photograph was taken by the uh, makaka and it was you it was taken by uh, a camera that was set up by a photographer named David Slater so David Slater set this up in the wild and the makaka came over and took the photo himself so then it was reused by a website. The photographer um, asked the website to take it down because he felt he owned the copyright. Well, it turns out that the Copyright Office ruled, in fact, that nobody owns it. The monkey cannot own the copyright, so therefore it is now a public domain photograph. Public domain means that it is open for anybody to use. Um, there's an article here which I'll open up real quick and it's a very short one <clears throat> but it talks about this, this specific case and uh, let's see where is it that uh, if it is produced by nature animals or plants then it becomes um, nobody's intellectual property nobody's copyright it is public domain Okay, so continuing on, um, here's an important thing for you guys to consider. So a lot of people feel that if you can download a photo from the internet, that it's free for you. So you can do whatever you want for it because it's on the internet. If you can hit download, uh, right click save, then you can use it. That is not true. Uh, you might be breaching copyright and you don't even know it. All right, so we're going to watch this quick video that kind of talks about that. So today's design chat, we're going to be talking about copyright. So if you've ever used an image that you found in a Google search in a project or downloaded a free font, this video is for you. As designers, sometimes we need to bring assets into our work that we didn't create ourselves, like fonts, icons, images. It's perfectly acceptable, totally legal, 
but only if you choose the right assets. Just because something is available online for free, it doesn't mean you have the rights to use it in your project. This is a guide to making sure you do have the rights to use the images, icons, and fonts that you find on the internet in your work. Now, I will preface this by saying that I am not a lawyer, but this is just my understanding of basic copyright law, and this is how I approach it. The first thing to do when you find an asset you want to use in your work is to look for information about the usage rights. Repository sites will generally have a page that gives you information about this, and on sites like Flickr, for example, the usage rights will be listed by each photograph because the user gets to decide what they are, they're not a site-wide thing. When you're searching for free assets, you might sometimes come across things that are marked as being in the public domain, like this one here. That means that you can use it for whatever you want. You'll also likely come across a lot of things that use a Creative Commons license. Now, something to watch out for here is that there are many different types of Creative Commons license. This one means you can use it for whatever you like as long as you give credit to the creator in your pro Okay, so I'm going to pause it real quick. And so this is really important. Creative Commons licenses are different. And she's going to go through a couple different ones here. And basically, um, so for this first one, it talks about attribution. You can use it, but you have to give credit to the photographer. So pay attention uh, the next on these next couple ones, and she's going to talk about the different types of Creative Commons licenses. Project. This one means you can use it if you give credit, but you can't make changes or derivatives of it. And this one here means you can use it if you give credit, but not if it's a commercial project. Okay, so commercial project. And we're going to be talking all about commercial pho photography in a couple weeks. But commercial means basically that you are selling it to be used for an advertisement, or you are using a photograph to create an advertisement. Um, so there, once you start using photography, or in this case she's talking about fonts and icons, to sell something, then the rules get way, way more strict on what you can do and how you can use different things. Those are just a few of the main ones that I often see, but there is a link in the description where you can find out more about them and what all those little symbols mean. The type of Creative Commons asset you can use in a project depends on the project. If it's a project for a client or a business or one that you're going to earn money from, you should only use ones that are available for commercial use, so none with this symbol here. There are much less assets available for commercial use, which is understandable, so you might want to look into something like stock photography, and I did a video all about that, giving you some advice on it, which you can watch right here. You might also want to look into purchasing an icon set or a subscription to an icon site to get those assets. Please keep in mind though that just because you're paying money for something, that also doesn't give you the rights to use it for whatever you want. For example, with fonts, there's a difference between purchasing the rights for a personal use license and a commercial license. Okay, so that is a really good point also. Um, there are so many fonts in particular that you can download for free. Libraries and libraries of fonts and photographs that you can download for free. But if you uh, turn around and try to use it for advertisement of sort, um, you have to make sure that you bought the commercial license to use it, or else you can get a whole lot of trouble. So read up on the usage rights carefully of the site that you're getting this asset from, and if you're not sure or if it's not clear, ask the site owner. Ignorance is no excuse to break copyright laws. You might be searching for an asset and come across one that doesn't have any rights information attached to it, like on Google perhaps, but just because there's no information there readily available to you doesn't mean you're allowed to use it in your project. You need to know explicitly that you do have the rights to use it. But if you do insist on using Google Images, here's a handy tip for you. If you go into the search tools, you can click on usage rights and select the license that you need for your project. Okay, so this is great. Usage rights. Um, so when you're working on a project, it's really smart to do something like this, to go into Google and change the usage rights. There's also other um, good tools here for size, color, uh, time. So if you're doing something on current events, you want something that's been taken in the last year versus 20 years ago, and there's even more tools available on Google search. So I would definitely recommend that you get in there and next time you do a search, and look at the different types of tools you have available for your search options. And then you'll only see images that have that license and you won't be tempted by other ones. It's really important to make sure that the work you're doing is legal for all projects, but especially for client projects. You don't want to be responsible for them being in breach of copyright because if they get sued, guess what, they're going to pass that cost on to you. You wouldn't want someone else stealing an asset that you'd worked hard on, so don't do it to other people. And on that note, I shouldn't have to tell you not to copy other people's work, but don't copy other people's work. There are ways to be inspired without ripping off their piece completely. Now, uh, 
We are going to get into copying and appropriation later on in this uh, module. <laughs> it's a very interesting topic. And I think I might do another video on that because it is a whole different topic. With that said, I hope that you enjoyed this video. And okay, so let's continue on. And of course, um, you can always get back to this video. Um, as you guys know, I post this lecture outline um, to your module, so you always have access and can always go back to it. Okay, so speaking of usage rights, there are different usage rights for different projects, and depending on what you are you going to buy an image to use for, let's say, um, there's going to be different prices and different rules on whether you're using it for social media, website, print, if it's for personal or for commercial use. So I'm going to go into Getty Images Content License. Now Getty Images is a stock photography site. They're one of the biggest in the world. Uh, they own the rights to so many different historical photographs as well. A lot of the photographs that uh, we've seen in you know the lectures about history and such. Um, they they just own a huge huge amount of photographs. But we're gonna look really look into Getty um, and some other stock sites later on when we talk about commercial photography. But I just wanted to touch on it really quick. So um, I'm going to hone in on this right here. We have um, different types of licenses and here and we have royalty free. We have rights managed or rights ready. So let's go to royalty free. So there are rules, and it, you know, depending on how much you pay for their, to use images from Getty, uh, these different things come into play. So perpetual means that you can use it for as long as you want. Uh, worldwide, you can use it wherever. Unlimited, you can use it any uh, limited number of times. Any and all media, so whether you're using it for social media or printing it in a magazine. Um, now, non-exclusive means that that image that you're using, that you're buying to use, that Getty can go ahead and sell it to somebody else to use. Now, let's say that you're a company, a huge company, and you want to um, use a photograph for uh, your logo or for your website, and you don't want anybody else to do it, that would be a buyout. And a buyout is equivalent to buying somebody's copyright, and it is very, very, very expensive. So non-exclusive is usually where most people end up going. Now rights min uh, managed and rights ready uh, means that uh, the price is going to be affected by the specific use, um, where it's going to be used, whether it's a magazine or social media or your website. How long? Is it going to run for a month? Is it going to run for a year, five years? If you are printing it, is it going to go, like, for instance, in a calendar? Um, how many calendars are, are going to get printed? Is it going to be a thousand? Is it going to be a million? Uh, it's, that's all going to depend, that's all going to change the price of that photograph that you want to use. Uh, placement, is it going to be the main photo for something or is it just going to be something small and off to the size, side, uh, which also has to do with the size of content. Uh, where it is, the territory, <clears throat> and any other restrictions that the website or the person puts on it. Um, and again, we see this non-exclusive here. So there's also restrictions, no unlawful uses, um, no commercial use of editorial content. So if you remember last week, we talked about editorial photography, photography that's used for a story, for a magazine, for the news. Um, and editorial content cannot be used for an advertisement. So, and that usually means that there has not been a model or property release, which I'm going to talk about releases in a moment here. Um, so there's all kinds of rules that go into it, and all of these rules also have to do with the pricing of photographs. So, um, and like I said, we'll get way more into stock photography and pricing and stuff like that in a couple weeks when we talk about commercial photography. So let's get back over here. All right, so when should you credit a photographer? You should pretty much always credit a photographer. If someone's worked hard to create a photo, a graphic, a font, whatever it is, you should probably um, give them some credit, okay? And there's this really great article here on how to uh, um, credit photographers in social media. And this article comes from a photographer who works with weddings and such. So um, she touches on some other important things too. And that's not what I want to look at. Okay. <laughs> um, 
such as making sure, you know, and especially in the wedding industry, um, they credit everybody. Styling and coordination. Florals, okay, who made these little floral arrangements here? Um, the hair, who did the hair? Who are the people? Who's where, what, where did the dress come from? Who's the maker of the dress? Um, the props, all of this stuff. It's all important things to credit, okay? And let's see. Okay, so this article is great. Why do you need to credit? Because the photo isn't yours. Because someone actually took that photo. Because someone um, planned this all out and put in a lot of time and effort. So you can't just, or it's not wise to just go ahead and repost something without um, ever hitting and tagging what's going on. And it's not just simply tagging the photo, it's also putting where you can actually find that person. And so on Facebook, it would be, you know, having their names on there as well with links to their profiles because maybe somebody, maybe they're planning on social media to get them more work. So you don't want to mess with other people's business. Okay, what is a proper credit? So this is great. A simple rule is to tag everything included in that one single image. Okay, so you should definitely take that into account. What's going on? Um, what is create? What is in the photo? And how can you tag those people so they make sure that they get their credit that's due? All right, and here's some more examples. So, like I said, um, you know, go ahead and you can always come back to this article in my lecture and recheck on what's going on. Um, something else is that people tend to do is they might put a little you know caption and then they put dot 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 and then put the credits yeah don't do that just be straight up don't make people dig for the credits okay just put it there okay continuing on so if you credit a photographer is it okay to use the photo well simply put no it's not okay uh, just crediting the photographer is nice but if you don't have permission from them to uh, repost their photo, then it's probably not a good idea. Okay, so, um, you know, and I'm talking about, you know, if you're reposting a photo of your niece or nephew, okay, that's a whole different ball game, right? That's, you know, family photos and such. But I'm talking about, like, professional photos. Uh, people who call themselves a photographer and they're a professional photographer, meaning they're actually making a bulk of their income as a photographer. You want to make sure that, you know, you send them a quick message um, or whatever to ask permission. All right, so here is an example of a photographer who took this hilarious photo and then it turned into a meme. <laughs> All right, so this was a meme for a while ago. And um, this guy is uh, a horse photographer. This is what he does for a living. And then he puts his horse photographs on Getty Images to sell them for people to use. Um, so one day he woke up and someone had found his photo and turned it into a meme and it was spreading like wildfire all over the internet. And he was pretty pissed because now this means that it's everywhere. Um, it means that no one's probably going to buy this image for him to use. So he's losing money now. And this whole article goes into all of the time he went into going to different sites and getting the image taken down. Um, everywhere from, let's see, we have Yahoo, Facebook, I think he um, wrote to Pinterest, uh, here we have DeviantArt, and there's a lot of information here on exactly what he did. Now, some of you guys might think, oh, well, what's the big deal? It's just a meme. Like I said, he's now losing money on this. And uh, we don't always uh, remember that, that just because you find something on the Internet doesn't mean it's just up for grabs for us to use. Um, people are dependent on this stuff to make money and pay their own bills. So we have to be sensitive about that. So one of the ways that he went about um, getting his stuff taken down was using a cease and desist order. And uh, one of you guys might end up using this someday, or you might end up getting one someday. But quite simply, cease and desist means stop do doing what you're doing and don't do it anymore. And here there's a link to where you can download all kinds of free cease and desist letters, and there's different types. Um, I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom. 
Then that's where, so we have trademark infringement, debt collection, defamation, copyright infringement. Okay, so copyright infringement, someone's using your photograph without permission, without paying you, um, then yeah, you can go ahead and make a cease and desist letter and send it to them and get them to take it down, hopefully. <laughs> okay, so that's where I'm going to stop out for this video, um, and I'll pick up on public versus private shooting on public versus private property in the next.